welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Now, right now, some of you are struggling, whether it's related to your job, your family, or your health. Just remember, you are not alone. But as hard as things can be, I want to remind you that every cloud, believe it or not, has a silver lining. It just may not feel like it right now, but it's now a perfect time to focus on your health and to take a few simple steps to transform your life and pursue some things you maybe always wanted to accomplish. And my guest today is a great person to help guide you on that journey of self-discovery. Lewis Howes is the New York Times bestselling author and the host of the hugely popular The School of Greatness podcast. And today, he and I are going to talk about all the ways you can emerge from this COVID-19 crisis mentally stronger than you've ever been before. We'll also discuss the best advice Lewis has ever gotten, can't wait to hear this, and the one simple thing you should start doing today to take back control of your life and health. Lewis, it's so great to finally have you on my podcast. Thank you, thank you. Very grateful to be here. So for listeners who don't know your story, tell me a little bit about your journey. Uh, you know, 12 years ago, I was pursuing a dream of mine to play professional football. Uh, ended up getting injured in 2007, playing arena football, indoor football by diving into a wall to catch a football as a receiver, broke my wrist, Played for the next 14 games with a broken wrist. Got surgery afterwards. The doctor said, you know, you probably should have got surgery a long time ago. They did a bone graft, took a bone out of my hip, put it into my wrist, and was in this position, you know, a 90-degree angle with my arm for six months trying to let it to recover and heal. And that was a time where 2008 came quickly after that. The recession went big. Everyone was losing jobs. People weren't hiring people with master's. It reminds me of this time right now. It's kind of like I was in a very dark place, depressed. My identity was shaped around football. That was over. My self-worth was identified around uh, my accomplishments in sports, and I can no longer put that into sports. I was living on my sister's couch at the time for a year and a half during this, just trying to figure out what am I going to do next? What's my next steps? How do I get out of this situation? How do I make money? How do I get a job? I really had no clue what I was going to do. Um, but within a few years, I, I had some great mentors and coaches. I had uh, a, a hunger and a desire to get out of that darkness. And through that, built some businesses, created the School of Greatness. And here we are, you know, 10, 12 years later uh, during this kind of downturn in the economy. So um, we're going to talk about this later, but this is a good segue. How, when you're down in that dark hole, you're, I mean, nothing's going right. Uh, you know, your, your career, it's over. How, and you said, I just had that drive. Help our listeners to understand. Okay, come on. <laughs> How do you get the drive? Yeah, where, where's the drive? Uh I didn't get any, I didn't have any drive for about a, about a year. I literally laid around and I ate macaroni and cheese and ramen noodles, everything you're not supposed to eat with the Gundry diet. Oh yeah. And uh, and and watched bad TV for a while and and just allowed myself to be depressed and kind of down and out and uh, and angry. You know, I was angry at the world. I was angry at my coach who put me in this play where I broke my wrist. I was I was uh, thinking everyone was out to get me. No one understands me. Why did this happen to me? And that type of thinking kept me stuck and kept me down as opposed to a different type of thinking, a creative thinking, a thinking of service, a thinking of, okay, well, this happened. Let me accept it. Now, what skills can I build up that I don't have that will support me for my future? And that was really after a while of this, I just, the hunger came from really not having any of the options. My dad had just gotten into a car accident where he was in a coma for many months and he's still alive today, but he's not the same person. So I didn't have my father as an emotional, mental or financial support anymore. So I didn't have another backup plan. And so everything came down to, okay, I don't have family to lean on uh, beyond sleeping for free on my sister's couch. I don't have you know, these opportunities here with my dad or this or that. 
So what will, what am I going to do with this time? And instead of being angry about everything, I started to first grief and I'll just kind of share the process for me. It was like, okay, my whole life and dream was to be a pro athlete. I did it for a short amount of time. I didn't get to the level I want to, and it stopped quickly. I need to grieve this. And it took me some time to really like accept that I wasn't going to be that person anymore. And I think when you have a, a vision in your mind for 10, 15 years, like I did, it's hard to let go of something. It's hard to let go of your career or relationship, whatever it may be that you're holding on to. So for me, I, I started to learn how to grieve and I did it poorly. I, I got angry. I was this. And then I finally learned how to like let it go after years. And I started to, I started to find the right mentors and, and find the right group of people to spend time with and learn from. And from those mentors, they talked to me about the importance of perspective. And you got to hear other stories about people who went more tragic experiences in their life. And that gave me a sense of gratitude. So I started to say, okay, you know what? What can I be grateful for? You know what? I got to live my dream and play sports professionally. Most people don't get to do that. I have a sister that allows me to sleep on our couch for a year and a half. I'm not homeless. You know, it's finding that perspective and gratitude. And the next thing was really creating goals. I think this is a perfect time to create new goals for yourself. Maybe the plans, the, the goals you had are broken. You can't do them anymore. And I started creating goals. The first goal is how do I make $100? And, and then it became how do I make enough money to get out of my sister's place and get my own apartment? How do I, you know, what does that look like? I just started really small. I had big thinking, big dreams, but I had to start small on these baby steps. And those goals, I, I've, I've heard of the research from people, you probably know better than me, but having goals is actually decreases depression for people. Just having something to work towards that you're inspired by decreases depression, decreases anxiety, all these different things. And so by having new goals, it will set you up for more peace in your heart. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to set you up for less frustration. Okay, so you talk about mentors. Uh, well, I mean, what do you do? Phone a friend? Yeah, I didn't have many mentors at the time. Of I didn't have access to resources with people at the time. This is 2008, 2007, 2008. What I did have was who I knew. I knew coaches from the past, from college and high school, that I really respected and admired. I called my coaches. I called uh, some, a couple of teachers. One was the headmaster of the, a small university I went to called Principia College, who I really respected there. I called him. And I talked to a couple of my dad's friends. I was just like, anyone that I could talk to, who do I respect? Who knows more than me? I talked to my family. So it started small. But then one mentor uh, said, why don't you check out LinkedIn? This is in 2007. He's like, go make a profile. I think there was 10 million people at the time on it. And I, he goes, I hear people are getting jobs there. So go check it out. So I just start saying, okay, I'm going to take the words of the mentor. I'm going to take massive action on their information. I'm going to try things, make mistakes, and learn as I go. LinkedIn ended up being my greatest asset for the next few years because it was there where I was able to find CEOs, executives, founders, leaders, and email them and message them and get responses and get on the phone with a lot of them, meet a lot of them in person, and build new mentorships from actively reaching out on LinkedIn to people. And it was one of the greatest places for me for many years. And um, that's what I did. I started just being, how can I build a profile that's so unique and creative that people want to respond to me and want to connect with me? And what can I offer them? When I felt like I had nothing to offer, how can I offer a mentor value? And, and that's the process I took. So you created a profile. I mean, did, did you lie? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, in every great resume, you usually try to, uh, in every great dating profile, you show your best photos. You don't show like the stuff where you made your mistakes. You put your best foot out there. And so for me, I was like, okay, who do I want to connect with? In the time, I wanted to be in the sports world. I wanted to do a sports job. I had a sports marketing degree uh, that I eventually got. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to get a job, I want to work in sports because it's what I know at the time as a 24-year-old. So what do I need to position in my profile that's going to get me to in the door with people at sports companies, you know, big CEOs in the sports world? And I just led with being a professional athlete, even though 
I wasn't in the NFL. I was a professional athlete. I got paid in the Arena Football League. I led with my accomplishments. You know, I was a two-sport All-American. I broke a world record in football for the most yards in a single football game. Um, I led with the things that I had best first and openly spoke about those things. So I didn't talk about my, and I said I had a college degree, which I did at the time. It took me seven years, but I didn't talk about anything else really because I didn't have any other skills. So it's lead with the best foot forward, you know, make it look shiny and hopefully someone will respond. And, and people responded. <clears throat> people responded. I mean, I connected with the, the CEO of ESPN at the time, the founder of ESPN, a lot of big executives, leaders. <clears throat> and what I did is I was just really good at following up with people and saying, how can I support you? What's your biggest challenge? Who do you need connected to? My secret weapon became the power of my network. I didn't have the skill set to help people personally with, uh, let's say, marketing or design or video editing or sales. I didn't have those skills. But what I did have was the ability to put myself out there, build a relationship with someone important, ask them what they needed, and then source from my network someone who could help them. And I became essentially a matchmaker of problem solving. And that became a superpower, which I had no clue was a skill, but I did it through action. So were you a people person before all this? <sighs> I would say I was a outgoing, happy guy that wanted to connect with people, but I didn't know how to do this in a professional setting or, you know, how to be do this in a career setting. It was just like hanging out with my buddies and the football team. So I didn't know how to translate it necessarily. And so I made some mistakes early on until I realized like no one wants to respond to someone when they ask for advice, but they always want to learn. They always want to share their story of success with someone. And so when I started thinking, okay, if this person has no time, they have everyone messaging them, everyone trying to get a phone call with them. Why would they respond to me when I have nothing to give them if all I'm asking is to pick their brain, take 10 minutes of their time when they don't have it? So when I realized that doesn't work, I stopped asking for advice. I stopped asking for a job. I said, you know what? I was really inspired to read this article about how you shifted from this part of your career to this part of your career. It's fascinating to me how you became successful in that area of your life. Can you share with me that story? Most of the time, people are like, yes, I'd love to talk about how cool I am, how successful <laughs> I, you know, it's just shifting the question and the, and the perspective and in doing so, they're going to give you all the advice in the world and they're going to think of you higher and they're going to want to help you in return because you gave them something most people don't give them. So, um, how, okay. Person's listening at home or watching at home and they go, well, yeah, but you know, you, you're Lewis Howes, you're, you're a famous <laughs> football player. Yeah, maybe you were on your sister's couch, right. but that's, that's not me. I, you know, I stuff, just- But this stuff comes natural to you. It's easy for you, all that stuff. Yeah. Here's what I'd say. Um, I remember at this time when I was on my sister's couch doing this, I was so afraid of many things. And I remember being crippled to speak in public in front of five people. I couldn't do this in school. I was in the special needs classes where every time, this was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. When a teacher would say, okay, class, we're gonna read aloud and we're gonna go around the class and each person's gonna open up a page and we're gonna read out loud into the class. That would terrify me because I wasn't able to read the words and speak them out without stuttering and stumbling and messing it up. It's just very difficult for me. And speaking in front of an audience was my greatest fear because I was just terrified. So during this time on my sister's couch, as I was reaching out to mentors and coaches and people to uh, share their story of success, but really to give me advice, one mentor was a professional speaker. And I was so inspired by and admired his ability to be able to go around the country and speak and get paid. And I thought, how cool would that be? Problem is, I don't have the ability to speak without stuttering and stumbling in front of people. And so he gave me, I said, can you share your story of how you did this, how you became so successful? He took me out to coffee at a Barnes and Noble Starbucks in Columbus, Ohio. He bought me the coffee. He took his time uh, when he was busy to teach me because of the way I framed the question. And he gave me everything I needed. He said, you need, if you want to become great at public speaking, whether you want to do this full time and make money doing it, or you're going to get a job and you need to present into a boardroom, 
you need to learn how to persuade people with your ideas, whether you do this as an entrepreneur, career, whatever it may be. That's when you become a great leader, being able to persuade people with your ideas. He said, you, he said, you need to join Toastmasters. You need to go to this group of public speaking class every week and do it until you're not afraid. And it was the last thing I wanted to do was to dive into public speaking classes and to be made fun of and to stand in front of a groups and practice. It was the last thing. But that's what I did. I did it every single week for a year. And I got a coach at this group who helped me. We watched film of myself doing it, which is horrible to watch yourself when you're bad at something and critique it and analyze and give feedback. And every week I would just go back and do it over and over again until the end of the year. I remember being able to get up in front of an audience after a year of doing this with no notes, no podium, nothing, and just be able to present ideas for 10 minutes. And it seemed like a long time then to speak for 10 minutes as a 24, 25 year old. But I remember just feeling this sense of peace and confidence that I never had before. And so what I started doing was creating a list of all my biggest fears and saying in order to you know, overcome these challenges, like you said before, well, you're Lewis Howes and this comes easily for you and this and this. A lot of these things never came easily to me. I just decided I was going to turn my fears into a superpower so they didn't have control over me. So if I were you right now, I would create a list of your biggest fears. What are the things that hold you back? For me, it was public speaking. It was salsa dancing and dancing in general in front of people because I just never felt confident dancing in front of people. I always felt awkward. I was this tall, lanky white boy that had no moves. And so I went all in on learning salsa dancing. Went out three times a week to clubs. I took group lessons, private lessons, YouTube tutorials, like everything until I was no longer afraid to go out and dance in public. And the more I wrote down my fears and tackled them until they disappeared, the more confident I became in every area of my life. And that's, that's the process for me, finding great mentors and people to give me some type of model. And doing the thing that I don't want to do over and over again until I actually start to enjoy it. I never thought I would enjoy standing in front of a stage in front of people and speaking. I never thought because I hated it. I never thought I would enjoy salsa dancing in front of people. I never thought I would enjoy doing these things that I do now. I never thought I would write a book. You know, it's like I almost flunked out of English class. So I never thought I would do that. All these things that I took on as fears, I now really enjoy and they've become superpowers. Okay, School of Greatness. Your show is School of Greatness, and there it is right behind you. So what are, what are, how'd that get started? I can see, I think, how it got started. What are the common <laughs> attributes that make your guests great? Um, how did it get started? Seven years ago, I moved to L.A. Eight years ago, I moved to L.A. for a girl that I was dating long distance. Uh -oh. The day I moved here... Uh, she broke up with me and we ended up getting back together the next day. And it was like up and down for many months, but it was an emotional roller coaster. And I just moved from New York city where I was loving it. My business was growing. I felt more confident than ever. And then I moved to LA. I don't know anyone. I don't like it as much. This girl and I are having challenges and I'm like, what is going on with my life? And things start to fall apart. And as they started to fall apart over that next year, I, I said to myself, like, man, I thought everything was going pretty good in my life. I was 28, 29 years old, whatever it was at the time. I had I, I built a business after being on my sister's couch. I went and built a business, multi-million dollar company, ended up selling the company. Like I was getting awards and accolades. I felt like myself again from sports days. But that was all on the outside. On the inside, I was really insecure. I was nervous. I was scared. I was projecting an image. I wanted people to look at me as opposed to really being vulnerable. I had a big ego. I'd react to people, all those things that I didn't like. And it started to come out more and more after moving to LA and being in this relationship that was up and down and, and ending. And I remember being stuck in LA traffic one day. I know you know this feeling. Um, <laughs> And feeling like, man, I just feel kind of stuck in my life. Like I was, it took me an hour to go two miles or whatever <laughs> it is. 
And I was just like frustrated with the relationship, frustrated about this and that. And I said, you know what? I am afraid of a lot of things still. And I thought I'd conquered all these fears, but there's a lot inside that I'm still afraid of. And I wish they would have taught me this stuff growing up. Like I wish the first 30 years of my life in school, they taught me about failure. They talked me about grieving. They talked me about going through breakups and relationships. They talked to me about how to have better health, all these things. They talked to me about scaling my business right now. Like I'm just feel stuck and I want to know more. And that was the, the moment where I was like, I think this, you know, I think I could do a podcast. This is pre podcasting. And I was like, I think this podcasting thing might be a a way for me to do this, where I can interview people that I know and learn, be selfish and learn, but also share with other people. Because up until then, I had just been kind of reaching out to friends for help, but not sharing the wisdom with others. And that's where I was like, okay, I'm going to call it the school of greatness because I wish this is all the stuff I wish they would have taught in school and an education system that they never taught me. Maybe a coach would teach this stuff every now and then, but in school they didn't. And I was like, this is the stuff I truly need. And uh, that became the the moment I launched it seven years ago. And I just said, I'm going to look for the greatest minds in science, in spirituality, in finance, money, business, health and wellness, and figure out how to optimize li- my life and people who want to listen. And, and that's how I found you. Ah. Gosh, I got to get on your show one of these days. Really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, w- w- so what are some of the most interesting things you learn from your guests? Got any oh, real you know, gems? It, uh, yeah. I mean, I usually bring people on with what I need the most at that moment in my life. So, like when I'm going through relationship challenges, I'm like, man, I need to bring a relationship expert on and teach me how to improve this in my life. And typically, there's a lot of people that are going through relationship challenges at that time. When I want to grow something in my business, I'm like, who can I call who's that person? Uh, So the gems are always kind of like, they're timeless, and they're also timely to what I want at that moment. Um, But I mean, the gems that you told me, you know, really about, I put so much olive oil on my food now because of you, and (laughs) I'm just dousing my vegetables in olive oil. And I used to not like olive oil before, but now it's like really tasty, so... Um, that's one thing that's a gem right there, but I think, I think, you know, everything that you teach about the health side of things is always really valuable. And so I would say, check out all your stuff there, but I really like to talk to, you know, the spiritual practitioners, the, uh, the, the great athletes who learn how to channel their inner world, their inner mind, their inner heart and manage pressure and, and create more peace in their life and get into the zone. I think when we, um, you know, the guys like Kobe Bryant, who I had on, he always talked about uh, getting in the zone. And it's hard to come from a creative place if your inner world's in chaos. And when your inner world's in chaos, it's hard to perform and be in the zone because you're anxious, you're stressed, you're worried. So I like, I like his message there. Um, yeah, lots of great stuff. What was the best piece of advice you've ever been given? That's a really tough one. Best piece of advice from my podcast or just in general? Yeah, just in general. Hey, let's go in general. Uh, uh, you know, my dad, uh, the first thing that came to mind is my dad. He never celebrated my birthday as a child. And I remember probably nine or 10 years old being like, Dad, how come you don't celebrate my birthday when all these other kids have parties and gifts and presents and they're celebrating and I don't get anything? And I go, do you not love me? And he said, he looked at me and he said, Lewis, I love you very much. And I celebrate you every day. The challenge is I don't believe in time and age. And I don't want to emphasize time and age with you or anyone because I've seen too much in the world that people think they're too old to go take on this dream or to start this thing. And a lot of people think they're too young to believe in themselves that they're capable of doing great things. So I never want you to be limited by your age or time on what you're capable of doing. And I was like, yeah, but dad, you can still give me a cake and presents, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, come on. But, uh, <laughs> I, but that, that lesson is kind of more of a mindset philosophy. And I think this is something we talked about too, where it's like, you even said in our interview, it's not anti-aging, it's, what was it the word you use? De-aging. De-aging, right? It's like, it doesn't matter how old time-wise you are or young time-wise you are. 
you know, you can always uh, create more wisdom in your youth and you can always de-age in your quote unquote older years to be youthful. So for me, it's, it's just not having a limiting mindset. Hey, well, dad sounds like a pretty smart guy. Smart guy. All right. So this is a really difficult time for most people, emotionally, financially, physically. What can they do to, to get through this? Um, I was talking with a, uh, a doctor about the signs of happiness. You know, her research, Dr. Lori Santos, is all about the signs of happiness and the research behind what makes you happier, even in the darkest times. And when I asked her this question about like, how do you become happier when everything is against you? She said it really comes down to two things. I mean, there's a bunch of things that you can do, but there's two main things. And the first one seems just like so basic and so simple, but she said there's so much research backing the evidence of gratitude, how it automatically increase. I mean, you'll probably talk about this, how it automatically increases your immune system capabilities. It increases the uh, dopamine and serotonin and increases things when you think about gratitude, something that someone did something nice for you a perspective, how your life can be is better than where it was before, or it's better than someone else. Um, you know, a gratitude of where you live in the world. I live in freedom. I live in America. You know, I'm healthy. Just anything at all that you can hold on to. Gratitude being number one. The second thing would be to, you know, the reason why we are lonely, sad, depressed, anxious, worried, all these things in my opinion, comes back to um, a lack of service mentality, a lack of focused outward on other people. We're so focused on what we lack, what we don't have, what we're not getting, what someone did to us, as opposed to saying, okay, this is happening, but I'm going to put my energy on helping other people. And when I focus on myself more and more, I feel my ego swell up and my my suffering continue to grow. But when I focus on others, how can I give my gifts to other people? How can I contribute? How can I smile and call a friend? Whatever level of contribution you can give, the more service oriented you are, the more happier you'll become. And that's the two main things that she talked about. It's like, if you want to increase your happiness, gratitude and service to other people. Yeah, you're so right. I'll, I'll give you an example this morning. Uh, we had a huge windstorm uh, last night in, in Montecito, and a big tree fell down near us, knocked down the power line, uh, no power, and uh, 67 people, uh, residents without power. And I go to get in the shower this morning, and it's ice cold water. And, mm. and of course, the garage doesn't open. And, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> and I'm sitting there kind of going, you know, this is, what, this is terrible, you know, what a bummer, you know, I, I got no electricity. So, and then I went, you know, last year at this time, I was in Ethiopia for charity water and they have no electricity. And these poor women, you know, were going two miles carrying water. Jerry, for water yeah. on jerry cans and, you know, hyenas, the whole bit. And I go, you know, I am so lucky that I actually have cold running water. <laughs> you have running water. Yeah, I actually have cold <laughs> running water. I don't have electricity, but I got running water. And I, I made me think back and I said, how, you know, how thankful I should be just to have a cold shower. And it just yeah. to totally changed my entire perception. Just being thankful for, you know, yeah, a lot of things went wrong this morning, but even in our worst situation, we're, we're so much better off than just about anywhere else than yeah. people we know. And That's true. Yeah. All right. And you also had a, a, was it two years ago, where you had a massive flood in Montecito where tons of houses were wiped out? We lost out. our home. Yeah, your house was wiped out. Yeah. So you can say, well, okay, at least my house didn't get wiped out this time. It was just a tree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to remember that one too, yeah. Okay, in the midst of all this craziness, how do you stay calm and focused on your goals? Uh, 
you don't. I think <laughs> you don't stay calm and focus on your goals. You just manage with what you have until you can figure out uh, how to get there. And so for me, it was, you know, a lot of survival mode feeling of just like, I need to make a little bit of cash so I can buy some food for myself. I need to, you know, it was kind of day by day at that point for me. And I think it's really hard to say, well, I'm going to stay calm and everything's going to be okay. And I'm, and I'm going to practice gratitude and all these things when you feel like you have nothing. That's the baseline though. If you can continue on this routine of gratitude, if you need to write a journal, if you need to call someone every day, whatever it is, that's what helped me. And I also highly recommend having some type of coach or accountability friend. At that point, you may not be able to pay for a coach, but you can find a friend and say, hey, listen, I'm going through some really challenging th times right now. I'm really struggling. And I know that I'm going to go into a darker place if I isolate myself and my words and my thoughts. So can we check in every day? Maybe it's three times a day for 10 minutes you need to check in with someone. Have someone to check in with once a day in the morning and at night and say, here's what I'm going to do today to help me get closer to my goal. These are the three actions today. I'm going to call five people. I'm going to email this person. I'm going to work out. I'm going to eat what, whatever it is. You do the three actions that day that are going to get you closer to the goal. At the end of the day, you check in with your accountability friend or your coach and you say, here's what I created. Here's what I took action on. Here's why I struggled. And here's what I'm going to do tomorrow. And it's focusing on the bigger goal that you have. That goal might be a month goal of like, I need to make a hundred bucks. Or it might be something bigger, but you you keep the action small day to day, and you can uh, you can celebrate those wins. It could be like I emailed three people today. Great, let's celebrate. You did something good. You were productive as opposed to yesterday. You sat on the couch all day. So it's celebrating the wins, having the accountability, and having a simple action plan daily. When we are taking action, we feel like we accomplished something. We're more productive. We increase our levels of happiness. And we can try to do more the next day. And I think that process – and you can also not beat yourself up because beating yourself up is the worst thing that can that happen. You're already going through survival mode, struggle mode, uh, stress mode. Beating yourself up more, I should have saved money six months ago. I should have done this. I could have done this. I wish I didn't make this stupid decision. That's going to hurt you. So don't beat yourself up. Own it, accept it, and say, what am I going to do to fix this? What do you say to someone who just lost their job? How can you possibly express gratitude over losing your job? Uh, I have this technique that I call, I don't know if I heard something like this and, and came up with it or what. I don't know if anyone else has this technique but I, I went through some challenging times in the last couple of years with a relationship. And I remember feeling a lot of pressure and judgment from friends, followers, whatever. And it was, it was not fun. It was not a fun experience being judged by a lot of people without them knowing the truth and the facts and all these things like that, and people making assumptions. And I said to myself, you know what? This sucks right now. This is really crappy. Um, and I don't like this feeling at all of feeling abandoned, of feeling lied to, manipulated, all these different things by a lot of people. But what I'm going to do, like when I trace back bad things that have happened in my life, usually something good comes from it. Like I learn a lesson, I meet someone, like I shift in my business, my health transforms. Usually it takes us going through something bad to break through. And so I had that awareness and I said, okay, I've got five, six years of great interviews I've done. So I've got some tools from people that can help me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself a year out from now and I'm going to have what I'm calling hindsight now. So I'm going to imagine it's the end of the year, it's New Year's Eve and who are the people in my life that I'm talking to and what are all the things that happened that set me up for success a year from now? What are all the good things I'm going to come from this? Where are the benefits of this? How, you know, what am I going to be super grateful for in a year from now? And every time, which was multiple times a day where I felt like this pain inside, this suffering, this agony, this betrayal, these whatever feelings they were, I kept saying, I'm having hindsight now. In a year from now, this is all going to be better. I'm going to learn something great. Uh, I'm going to meet someone 
better. I'm going to transform in a unique way. Like I just kept putting myself into the future. And that perspective allowed me to get through that moment of pain until the next moment of pain. And I just kept staying in that perspective and saying, what are the actions I'm going to do today? What can I control today? And I'm going to keep showing up that way. So that helped me. It's like, why is this happening to me? It's actually, why is this happening for me? Is exactly. my friend yeah, Tony yeah. Robbins would say. Exactly. Yeah, and I, and I think that's the only way you can, you can possibly approach all this. You know, this is happening for me. I, I have yep. to figure out why this is happening for me because it sure feels like it's happening to me. And uh, once you figure that out, I remember just, kept, and I kept saying that to myself, okay, why is this happening to me? But, you know, this is going to benefit me and my, my business and everything in the world that I want to impact later because it's going to give me more perspective. It's going to give me more humility. It's going to give me more grace. It's going to give me more uh, you know, compassion towards other people. I'm going to be less judgmental. Like, and so I kept saying that to myself, like, this is going to give me so many more skills in the future. So, um, I've talked about this. It, this would seem to be a great time to do something new since uh -huh. so many people, number one, a lot of people have to admit they're in a job that re they really don't like. And, yeah, exactly. cer and certainly, you know, do what you love and love what you do. And that's still some of the best recommendations I know of. But this is an opportunity. Uh, and you're a guy who has looked at an opportunity, multiple ones. Is this a good time to go off and try something or no? I think if you're um, in survival mode, and you need money, then just go get a job that you need to, to survive right now because some people might be in that mode. Uh, but if you are in a place where you're like, okay, you know, I'm not in survival mode, but it's the perfect time, I think, to go do the thing you've always wanted to do. And you might need to like still be at your job and do that thing on the side and, and start building it on the side. I'm not saying leave everything and go, yeah. you know, go try something where you're not making money with but I couldn't agree more with you. I think it's the perfect time because we're going to be reminded more and more that that, that security you think you had in something that you didn't love may not be there. So you might as well do the thing you do love and, and go for it. So I think it's the perfect time to build that creative endeavor, to launch that thing, to start that book, you know, whatever it may be, to go do it. Learn to be a public speaker. <laughs> what, and I would say, you know, whatever the thing that makes, and usually we don't do the thing we want to do out of fear, fear of other people's opinions, fear of judgment, fear of failing, fear, fear of success. And that's why for me, the most important thing is to write a list of those fears and then whatever the biggest fear is, go tackle that one first. And when you tackle all your fear and you essentially do what Batman did, which was, you know, live in darkness, be surrounded by bats and you become that thing, that thing be turns into your superpower. So you're, you're very active on social media. How, what, are, what are your approaches to keeping a healthy balance between you know, the news intake now, the social media? Yeah. How, how do you, come on, how do you balance that act? I, I, don't, I don't watch any news. I'll, I'll, I'll get uh, updates from my girlfriend or a friend of mine if, of what I need to know. But the rest of it is I'll watch positive news. I'll watch to see what people are doing that are impacting people in a positive way. Um, you know, I'll watch those types of videos and stories. But I won't watch news or speculation about fear or what's to come potentially until it happens. Tell me about it. But the rest of it is like commentating on what might happen or the bad things that are going to be happening because of this. And I want to have positive thoughts and positive feelings so I can – be more in the flow. Like I said, Kobe Bryant, you can't be in chaos and creative at the same time, typically, and produ really productive. And you can't stay in that flow state that much. So I need to have peace of mind so that I can serve people at the highest level, support people, and just be a good friend to people. Um, so I don't consume much of the news unless I need to, unless someone said something that I'm like, okay, let me go read the, the details. And social media, uh, you know, for me, I just follow the accounts that are inspiring. So, so any, any advice for, I know this has been an advice show, 
where, do, where do you go? Uh, what are the resources for somebody who wants to strike out on their own? Strike out on their own. I mean, we've got School of Greatness. We've got lots of great resources here for free. People can check out on, you know, entrepreneurship and things like that. But I think uh, I would ask yourself the question, what is the biggest challenge you have right now? Maybe your health has been out of integrity for years and you're finally looking at yourself and you're not happy with where you're at. Then I would go to your your site and your Come podcast. on down. <laughs> exactly. I would go and say, okay. And, and I would challenge myself, what's the, the lifestyle change I'm going to create? Uh, you know, if your finances are and, and you're trying to start a, a side hustle, then we've got those resources. If you're spiritually disconnected, then for me, I like uh, a guy named Rob Bell. I like uh, someone named Liz Gilbert. I like Michael Beckwith. I like following those people for more spiritual tapped in connection. Um, so that's that's where I would go. Uh, do you read any books? You know, it's interesting. I was just doing like a little review of uh, of books this morning on my page, and I picked up two books. One, Think and Grow Rich. I, I think uh, this is by Napoleon Hill. I haven't read it in over a decade, but I want to pick it back up. And it's a book about thoughts and about shifting your thoughts. And I think when we shift our thoughts, we can start to create – stories in our mind and we start to attract those stories those movies in our minds same thing with our health if we start to imagine the health we want then hopefully we'll take better decisions and actions towards creating and manifesting the health that we want so that was one book uh, and i actually just have another book here that i picked off my shelf this morning uh, i grew up in a a religion that i'm no longer necessarily a part of or practicing but this book called science and health with Mary Judas Baker Street. Eddy, yeah. Yeah, by Mary Baker Eddy. And this was written in 1875. And the Christian Science Monitor is a is a, uh, a famous, credible publication that was founded by her. And this woman was sick and pretty much dying. It felt like she was dying her entire life, was in bed all the time. And in the 1800s, she created a movement with millions of people around the world of how she was able to heal herself through spiritual thought. And... It was, the Bible was confusing to her. So she went and did research on science and medical doctors, and she started to research how to heal the body through thoughts, through the mind and that philosophy. And you see people like Dr. Joe Dispenza and other people like that talking about these philosophies in their own way with different types of research today. But that's the type of uh, philosophy I was growing up with was – you know, our thoughts are greater than our physical bodies and you can shift and heal with the ideas in your mind. So, it, you know, I haven't read that in a long time, but it's something I was like, yeah, maybe I'll pick it up and just see what comes to mind. Wow. We've covered a lot, a lot of territory. This is good. <laughs> this is very good. Uh, when we need to cover this kind of territory. It's all about adding value to people. And I know you do this on your show uh, as much as you can with, with all the different topics you cover. And I think if, if people truly organize their thoughts and their life better, they will have a better life. So what do I mean by that? You know, when, when this stuff started happening, whatever, you know, over a month ago, I remember just saying, okay, how can I take inventory of my life? And if you're listening or watching this right now, you can literally get out a piece of paper and a pen. I have this journal. I have tons of notes from you when I had you on in here. And I literally just will take inventory on the categories of my life that I'm struggling with. And so you can put my health as a top category. Am I happy with my health? Am I setting myself up to have more energy, more clarity, more focus? Do I feel good? You know, it's not about having the perfect physique, but is the body giving you the energy you need to, to be passionate, to like be clear, to not react uh, to people all the time, but respond in a more peaceful way? And if it's not, then okay. Let me take inventory on what's off. Let me take inventory on my finances. Have I looked at my banking account lately? Do I know where my money's going? Do I know when it's coming in? Take inventory. What about my physical space? I cleaned out my closet in the first week after all this happened. I was like, man, I'm just holding on to a lot of junk that I don't need. So let me clear this out and organize and take inventory. My relationships, What's what do I need to organize and take inventory? So all these areas of your life, I would write down 
and start to organize. Am I happy with these categories of my life? Do I have too much baggage that I need to let go of in these areas? If so, what are those action steps? And when you start to organize and have an awareness of all the inventory, it gives you peace of mind. When you don't know where things are, it makes you feel stressed out. When you don't know, you know how your body works, you're going to be unclear. It's going to stress you out. When you don't know where your money is, it's going to stress you out. When you don't know all these things, it's going to stress you out. So focus on inventory. And I think those would be great steps to start with is to just have organization of your life. So then you can go take action. On it. It's kind of like, I don't know if you remember back when you had a test or a quiz or homework to work on, when you take homework home and you put it in your room, Dr. Gundry, and you say, you know what? My room is messy right now. So let me put this homework thing on hold and I'm going to actually clean my room. And then I'm going to go do the homework project that I've got to do. It's like, it's hard to be productive on something we need to get done when we have a messy room. And so you've got to declutter your life so that you can have a clear mind to take action on your homework or the project you're working on. You and my mother, come on. Did you, did, <laughs> right? did you talk to her or what? <laughs> and you got to make your bed. If you make your bed every morning, it's, it's something I started doing about seven years ago. And I wish I would have listened to my mom earlier. But I'm telling you what, this one simple act of making your bed, it will will transform the way you feel about yourself the rest of the day. And you'll come home to a clean space and it just feels better coming home and, and untucking the covers and getting in. It makes you feel at peace that day. And I've uh, my girlfriend moved in a few months ago and she gets up later than me. So the bed's not made half the time. And it's like, oh, I want to just like get her out of bed so I can make it. But I'm telling you, it is a powerful thing if you can do that too. Uh oh, I, I can see we're going to have relationship issues. <laughs> uh, we we got to have a relationship expert on the right? school of greatness, you know, because exactly. you, know, you know this bed making thing is it maybe. <laughs> I've had two relationship experts on in the last two weeks. So it tells ah. us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lewis, it's been great seeing you again, and and thank you for coming on the podcast. You're going to be a great help at this time. You're always a great help. I'm taking my 5,000 uh, vitamin D every day. I'm taking the olive oil. Make sure you guys get the vitamin D. That stuff is a lifesaver. It really is a lifesaver. It really is. All right, School of Greatness. Uh, how do they find you? Yeah, just School of Greatness uh, on Apple or Spotify for the podcast. Um, we had an amazing interview with you a few weeks back that's been going viral. If people want to go listen to that. I feel like every time I get you on, I get you to share things you normally don't say because I ask it in a different way. So I uh, love people's perspective on that. And then just at Lewis House, lewishouse.com and at Lewis House on social media. All right. All right. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Dr. Gundry. Okay. Now it's time for the audience question. Charles Anton on YouTube asks, do vegans have a deficiency in methionine, isoleucine, and cysteine? No, you don't have a deficiency, but you do have less of these amino acids in a vegan diet than you would in an omnivore diet where you eat uh, even a vegetarian diet where you ate eggs and milk products. But what I see in my vegan population is that they usually run high homocysteines, which is another amino acid which is normally converted to methionine. And that's generally because you don't have enough of methyl B12 and methylfolate in your diet. And if you're vegan, you know that getting an adequate amount of B12 in your diet is very important. And I, I have all my vegans take a methyl B12 and a methylfolate regardless. But the absence of methionine in a vegan diet may be one of the reasons that vegans done rightly have extended longevity. Certainly in the Loma Linda experience, as you know, where I was a professor, Adventists in Loma Linda are some of the longest living people in the United States. We're, we're the only blue zone. The vegans are the longest living of the long-lived Adventists. And it probably is because Methionine is used by what's called mTOR as the energy sensor. And people on a low methionine diet, like vegans, in general are going to live longer. Animal studies support this. A low methionine diet 
makes animals not only live longer, but live healthier. And that's why you see in all my books, the more animal protein I can get away from you, I don't have to take it all away, uh, the better you're going to do in the long run. So, great question. No, you don't have a deficiency. Okay, and now it's time for a review of the week. After watching our recent episode on immune health, YouTuber Amelia Porter wrote, this was the most impressive, factual, clear, concise, informative, truthful video I have seen to date on wellness and immune health during these crazy times. I have shared it with everyone I love and care about. I agree with everything you stated and follow a similar health re regime and have for decades. Bravo, clapping hands, Dr. Gundry. Well, thank you, Amelia. That's, uh, those are very, very kind words. And, you know, I'm always looking out for you, and I want people to have what I consider the most update, unbiased, non-crazy information. There's so much misinformation out there on the internet, and you just got to be careful and, and pick your sources, and I'm, I'm happy you picked me, so we'll keep doing that. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.